Welcome to the Confluence Cast presented by Columbus Underground. We are a weekly Columbus-centric podcast focusing on the civics, lifestyle, entertainment, and people of our city. I'm your host, Tim Fulton. This week, we're exploring the evolution of downtown with Michael Brown. He has been a cornerstone in the city's development planning and worked both in and outside city government to cheer on its growth. Columbus Underground editor Walker Evans and Mike delve into the city's challenges and triumphs, the synergy between projects, the balance between iconic and neighborhood-level public art investments, and the concerted efforts to address systemic issues like homelessness and affordable housing. Through anecdotes and insights, they highlight Columbus's young, creative energy and the dynamic urban policies that continue to drive its growth. You can get more information on what we discussed today in the show notes for this episode at theconfluencecast.com. Enjoy the interview. Sitting down here today with Mike Brown. Mike, thanks for for joining us. Good afternoon, Walker. Um, Tim, it's just always good to see both of you out and about. Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, so, Mike, you are the uh, chief of staff for City Council President Shannon Hardin. Um, known you for a very long time, though, probably twenty ish something years. We're, we're pushing probably twenty two at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess just to kind of kick things off, you know, uh, I stumbled upon an old interview that we did, and I looked at the date on it, and it was twenty ten. And it was a lot of fun. And we'll link to it in the notes uh, on this. Um, but it was fun to go back and read the conversation we were having 14 years ago. And I'm like, you know what? We should we should update this. Mm-hmm. We should have you know. And we've talked since then, of course, obviously. But um, you know, uh, I guess let, let's let's rewind for folks who are unfamiliar with you. And can you kind of give us you know the short version of your your Columbus story, your Columbus history? Oh my. Um, you know, I came here for a job, like so many people. Uh, we'll call it the, the the late 20th century. It was the 1900s then, mm-hmm. kids. And uh, I came here for a job, you know, 23, 22 years old, had a, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of vision, like I'm going to be here for a couple of years and move on. And I just, I was very fortunate early to meet a lot of just interesting characters. Mm-hmm. And something I didn't expect when I first got here is I just started to fall in love with the town that to me just seemed so unfinished, mm-hmm. but have all this potential. All the right pieces were here. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of those people was city council president at the time, Mike Coleman. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, job one leads to job two, leads to job three. And I ended up working for then Mayor Coleman Mm -hmm. for a decade. And through that role, got to work on all of the the early downtown stuff, the 2002 plan, the 2010 plan. Mm -hmm. You know, I helped ghostwrite both of them with the great teams we had, like Kathleen Murphy and Amy Taylor and everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, really got to put my fingers into like just the, the clay of helping build a city, you Mm -hmm. know, and all that engagement that we did, all these charrettes and town hall meetings and just all the input, you know, early days of Columbus Underground even, you know, and Mm -hmm. really strong dialogue um, that came at you at the bar online, you know, when you're paying your parking meter Mm -hmm. Um, and the things we were finding out about then. Some of them are not that different than what we're finding about now. Sure, yeah. And yeah. Uh, from there, I went on and worked at uh, Experience Columbus for about eight years, mm-hmm. just kind of being a, a cheerleader for the city, you know, sharing the love, trying to get more national attention, mm-hmm. um, which the older I get, the more I'm like, no, we don't need any more national attention. We're actually doing fine. But um, that was a great job, and it opened my eyes more to how we really do compete with other cities, mm-hmm. um, sometimes in expected ways and sometimes in unexpected ways. But at the end of the day, you know, a city is, it's a home, it's a, it's a family, but it's also a, a major business mm-hmm. and you gotta, you gotta be out there doing your best. Um, or cities do fade. And, uh, it's kind of the thing like, you know, when you grow up with a, a Mike Coleman and then an Andy Ginther and a Shannon Harden, we were all people who worked together in various levels before they were council presidents mm-hmm. and mayors. And you just see that relentless, like tenacious ability to, to fight for their city. And, uh, you know, I was speaking with Mayor Ginther just the other day because he's doing a lot of things with the U.S. Conference of Mayors right now. Mm-hmm. And talk about a competitive bunch of people, you know. Um, 
But then from experience, Columbus, uh, you know, we did a lot of things like the NHL All-Star Game, and we pitched the DNC to try to get them here. Had a blast with all that. But when Shannon Harden was uh, becoming president of council, mm -hmm. you know, we did have a, a conversation, and he uh, – he brought me back into the City Hall family, and it's been a it's been a really great adventure for the last six years. Nice, nice. Um, and and I want to you know back up a little bit too because I think it's pretty easy to take for granted how much things have changed, specifically with downtown, but Columbus as a whole. Uh, so you know, 1999, 2000, 2001. You know, uh, the population of downtown was a fraction of what it was today. You know, uh, that three thousand to eleven thousand. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, the, one of the major issues was that um, there wasn't any place to live downtown. You know, and and I know that uh, Coleman and a lot of the two thousand two downtown plan was about rebuilding that residential population just to have a base to go from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you've hit the nail on the head. And when you do these big plans, you got to include a little bit of that kitchen sink mentality. You have to have this and this and this. Mm -hmm. But really, the two biggest goals out of the two thousand and two plan. Um, and all the people who worked on it, including, you know, some local business leaders who were very powerful at the time, who were like, don't even do this. Mm -hmm. It's too late. Mm -hmm. Look at what's happening in Cleveland and Cincinnati. Downtowns are fading. Downtown urban mall spaces are fading. Mm -hmm. People are moving to the suburbs. It's not worth the, the incredible investment that might be required to do big things. Yeah. And fortunately, you know, we also had a committee of the willing who loved downtown or had great memories of like a more active downtown back in the past. I mean, there were 30,000 residents downtown in 1950. Right. So we're still only a third of the way back to that. Yeah. And when we get to that density, we'll be truly successful. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the, at the end of the day, the plans come together with all that input and you have to have a couple focuses and, uh, Coleman and the folks he was working with really focused in on housing. Mm -hmm. Great cities are about great neighborhoods. Great neighborhoods are about the, the qualities of the people as a whole, you know, how they all come together to be, you know, the Hilltop and Westgate right next to each other, but very different neighborhoods based mm -hmm. on who chooses to live there over generations in time. Downtown's are the same thing. Yeah. They're about people at the end of the day. And if you don't have human density, mm -hmm. none of the other stuff is going to work. Retail won't work. Coffee shops won't work. Um, parking might be easier, but who cares? Yeah. You know, so that's why, you know, the first downtown plan wasn't about parking. Right. It was about housing yeah. really at the end of the day. And that's probably the number one accomplishment we got out of it is we fundamentally built confidence mm -hmm. that there is a market here and that market can be successful for the private sector. If you know, they can jump through some of the hoops that are, make it possible. It's, it's harder to build downtown. Right. But we were able to find a path. And I don't know. I think it, the current trajectory is very strong and demand is still really strong. When we see interest rates come back down, we'll probably even see sure, another yeah. beginning of the pop. Mm -hmm. We're kind of in a, a little bit of a gray zone because this interest rate system right now is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when you mentioned when you first arrived here and kind of got plugged in, one of the things that I've always said that I love most about this city is that it's very easy to get involved. You know, you, you raise your hand and before you know it, you'll be on like six committees and <laughs> all of your free time will be will be sucked up. Um, you know, it's it's nice that it's a big city. You know, there's plenty to do, you mm -hmm. know, no matter what you're into, there's plenty to do. But it's still a small city in that, like, you can get to know people pretty easily and pretty quickly. Did, yeah. did you find that that was the, the case that 20 means, years ago and still the case now to get plugged absolutely. in? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're one of the people that I found early and, or maybe you found me, I'm not sure how exactly it worked, but you think about it in this town, if you raise your hand and have a, an opinion on something mm -hmm. and you're willing to put some time in and make it just a little bit better, people are going to keep calling you back. Mm -hmm. And, but you do, you have to step up, you have to sign up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means, you know, you got to acknowledge that this is going to take a while. Mm -hmm. It ain't going to be easy. And there's going to be people out there who tell us that we're doing the worst thing ever and it will destroy their business or their neighborhood. Um, when I, I jokingly keep going back to in my head was the major fight we had. I'm going to guess it was 08, 09 ish over parking meters. Yeah. Um, fortunately, none of the dire predictions have come true. Mm -hmm. Um, parking still works. Mm -hmm. It's not, not the best in any downtown, short north. Um, but those new electric meters and the, all this stuff, yeah. it works. And the app. It's okay. Yeah. The app is fine. People mm -hmm. figured it out somehow. Mm -hmm. And we still have retail in the short north. And we still have all this other stuff. Yeah. Now, did the city do some other big things? Strategic parking garages in good locations? Um, yes. But together, all these things together then do support higher density mm -hmm. and better retail. Yeah. Because you, know, you don't want to be driving block to block in an urban area to find that next parking space just so you can run and get a cup of coffee. Yeah. You want to get out and yeah. walk. Yeah. And, and I, I think sometimes we're a little too quick to take um, 
feedback from people who, uh, you, you know, like there's in every city, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, there's a contingent of, you know, I'm stereotyping, I'm generalizing. There's a contingent of suburbanites who will complain like, well, I would go downtown if there was free parking and it was exactly where I wanted it. And, you know, you check all these boxes and yes, I will go. Those people have no intention of ever going downtown. Yeah. They're just complaining on Facebook, right? So you can't build a city for those people. You have to build an urban environment with urban tools. Yeah. Once you try and start making every space parking, you tear down all your buildings and then you have nothing but parking lots. Yeah. yeah. And over time, the other thing that people sometimes forget, yeah, we'll change the system like maybe every decade mm -hmm. on something like parking. That's yeah. Yes. City policy does matter, mm -hmm. but if it's not working, we do change it. We right. do learn from it. Right. right. That's one of the things I do love about Columbus. It's not just that anybody can step up, but we can constantly have this conversation and it's like the, you know, the old idea of a movable fees. Like it just keeps continuing on in a circle. And yeah, sometimes you realize we didn't do that right. Mm -hmm. Or we didn't do it fast enough and we got to alter course a little bit. Yeah. But at the end of the day, is it getting better every day? And are you still having fun? Mm -hmm. And are you still engaged? Um, yeah. but yeah, to getting back to your thing, um, the people in this town are very welcoming and it's a very young city. Mm -hmm. So that energy, that just, you know, what's the average age? You're 32. It's, it's below the national average, yeah, yeah by a couple of years. Um, that, to me, just is one of the reasons that we're going to continue to be successful overall. Yeah. Because it's about people, but people are going to have fun, and younger people are fun. And they are looking for that creative outlet. They're looking for that next comedy club or backyard show. Yeah. They're looking for that cool band. Um, they help drive what I think is a more interesting economy yeah. because the economy is not just money. It's about where people put their eyes and their attention. Do, do you think that there's a downside to having such a young uh, population and such a transient population of, you know, there's always new people moving here from somewhere else um, that they maybe take for granted some of the progress and change over the past couple of years? Because I, I'm sure there are people who have moved here within the past few years that mm -hmm. think that the Scioto mile has always looked like the Scioto mile. And I show them a photo of what it looked like 10 years ago, just 10 years ago. And they're like, Oh wow. I didn't realize that this asset was something that people had to fight to get done, right? Yeah, the big brown sludge pile that yeah. we had through our downtown that yeah. smelled. So, so do we, you know, uh, it's great to always be looking forward, but do you think we're missing something by not, you know, uh, by overlooking some of the achievements and not taking the time to say, oh, we're actually on the right path on a lot of things. I mean, I believe we are on the right path and I believe part of it is because we've got that young energy. I mean, mm -hmm. even someone like a Mike Coleman, moved here when he was in his 20s. Mm -hmm. It's it's part of our DNA of the city at this point. Yeah. But it brings in a lot of creative people also with great big ideas from something they saw somewhere else. Now, does it have some handicaps in that you do have to context set every now and then? Mm -hmm. You got to be able to ha have the patience to learn a little history before you maybe get a big idea done. Yeah. But it's energizing. And at yeah. the end of the day, like I said before about it, the economies, energy is a thing. Sure. And human energy does drive great cities to do big things. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have it, you fade. Yeah. And right now, Columbus is not fading. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about right now, and it's super nerdy and super technical, <laughs> is how many different plans there are right now. And a lot of times I think people can look at a plan and say, oh, well, this isn't going to happen or this will just get put on a shelf or whatever. Um, but we've seen a lot of you know accomplishments through planning initiatives over the past 20 years. But when you start to add up and how all these things intertwine between Rapid5, Link Us, Zone In, mm -hmm. uh, the updated downtown plan, the new Capital Line plan, mm -hmm. and you start to think about how these things sort of intersect and interact with each other, mm -hmm. um, th the way that these things are going to you know be built out over the next five to ten years, like that, that gets me really excited. Super and I know excited. you're you're someone who plays a role pretty actively in coordinating mm -hmm. with all these different groups. So is, I are, really are you, try. Are you I feeling really like try. there's yeah. magic there's in the air with these things? Synergy? There's, okay. true, there's yeah. truly synergy. And it's not even that they, none of them exist in a separate universe. And sure. that's something I think sure. that maybe Columbus wasn't good at 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you would have one-off projects. Right. And there was this massive project mentality. We're going to do this and it's going to be amazing. We're mm -hmm. going to build a convention center. They mm -hmm. said in 1988, we're going to build a, we're going to move COSI. Mm -hmm. We're going to build an Easton. Um, projects are important. You've got to have icons just like a confluence mm -hmm. out here at Gay and High, that beautiful art piece. Mm -hmm. You have to have some iconic public art, but you also have to have public art that's spread through all the neighborhoods. Right. And what we're doing better now is finding balance between the two mm -hmm. and making sure that as a city, and sometimes a county, the state, Ohio, um, and the business community that we're investing in both levels right. so that both things can be true at once. It's kind of a, what's your impact rules? Yes, and. 
-hmm. How do I get more yes and here? Um, Jeff Edwards was a part of that last downtown planning process, right. Right? right? He's had input in some of these other plans, but he's like, within this, all these truths and values and themes that we've identified for what we want to be, mm -hmm. wouldn't this project be amazing? He was right. Yeah, it is. It's really got people talking and it will, you know, as it gets built, make some fundamental changes in the way we operate. For me, I also look at it as it's not how cool it is just as of itself, but the, the part of culture change, it will help continue in this town mm -hmm. of getting more people out on their feet walking and more people on their bikes riding because this is still one of our, one of our failings is still with two car centric mm -hmm. in Columbus. And so everything we can do to make it just more fun and interesting to get out and do the thing on your feet yeah. um, is important. And that, um, as you add more people, you want more and more of that. But at the end of it, isn't that why it's fun to walk down Michigan Avenue in Chicago? Mm -hmm. It's amazing people watching. You feel that energy. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to figure out our versions of those great assets. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the, the public art component because that's another plan, GCAC's mm -hmm. public art plan, which I, I didn't mention as I was kind of rapid fire listing them off. Um, do you think, you know, planning is important, taking that 40,000 mm -hmm. foot view and looking at things very holistically, uh, how do you balance that with sort of like the controlled chaos of like something, something from the grassroots that kind of bubbles up because some of the best art is some of the stuff that somebody did, Absolutely. you know, in the cover of dark overnight and you're like, Oh, this Absolutely. spray painting sort of thing. Not that I'm encouraging, you know, graffiti on every surface, but, um, the, the Banksy type of stuff that just sort of appears, you know, I'm not even going to name names, but we all know some <laughs> friends who are artists who maybe yeah. leave little artsy gems all over yeah, our yeah, city. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also a huge shout out to, to Hakeem mm -hmm. who painted my garage door mm -hmm. in my little neighborhood, just North of downtown mm -hmm. did a massive space boy mural oh, right nice. on my garage door. You know, it's, it's six foot by 12 foot. Nice. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I love that kind of stuff. I believe that the best of public art is when you can walk around a corner not expecting it and you come upon something. Mm -hmm. I love those hidden little nuggets. I was at a carry out the other day picking up a bottle of wine and I saw a little tiny piece of art over on a brick wall just around the side. And I love that. It's kind of a plein air but made modern and punk. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, you've got to have that. And that's part of the, the, the culture of Columbus. But if we're doing our job really well, within this public art planning process, we've also going to be talking about how we take a, a Hakeem or somebody else and give them the tools and training to do more stuff like even, uh, you know, look at Mandy Kasky mm -hmm. and the scale of projects mm -hmm. she's doing now. And then what is next? Well, then you start to go national. Then yeah. you start to go international. But these artists here who maybe did start with some street art or maybe urban scrawl in Franklinton or Independence Day back mm -hmm. in the day, mm -hmm. um, they're still artists and they're still trying to figure out how to make a living and they yeah. would love to make a living doing their art. There, there has to be pathways within that. So we're not just yeah. buying the confluence icons that may cost millions or whatever is going to go on the prowl someday on the yeah. side of a mile. Yeah. One of my biggest frustrations is we still haven't answered that question. Right. We've got a nice little grove of trees on a spot that was made for a massive piece of public art. Mm -hmm. When's that going to get fixed? Over time. Yeah. But you gotta you got to mix that with the pathway so our local artists have a shot at actually getting good commissions that they can show their skill. And hopefully they can learn enough from it over time that they, they can market that to other benefits. Nice. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter what it is. You know, I mean, it can be statuary. But just because you start doing some small bronzes doesn't mean you know how to do a 30 foot, mm -hmm. right? There's steps that an artist goes through as they grow their craft. Mm -hmm. And if we do this public art plan well, there'll be pathways within that to help bring folks up in it as well as attract some of the big iconic stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, I joke that I want to turn my alley into an alley gallery and that um, every one of my neighbors also wants to put a painting on their garage door. Nice. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. We can. It's I not mean, that if, hard. If Jim Sweeney can do it with music on his street, That's you can do right. it with art in your alley. Let's hear for what's happened with Walnut Street. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the stuff, it does start at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. But is that not where you find a lot of the joy, too, a lot of the fun? Sure. You know, it's it's your neighbors that you spend a lot of time with. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can all kind of join in on that, that joint uh, love of having visual stimulus mm -hmm. in your neighborhood. Like I love it when little kids walk down my alley and I, I come around back, I'm taking out the garbage, something simple, domestic. And there's kids that are just looking at my garage door. They're like, who did that? Mm -hmm. You know, that's fun. Yeah. Should have a QR code to scan. So go to, that's a great idea. Hakeem's website. Hakeem yeah. art and stuff. Yeah. Follow him on Instagram. Um, 
you know, one of the things that I will say uh, that does frustrate me a little bit as I have conversations in the community with all kinds of different people, um, people are really quick to look at a problem that our city is facing and then internalize it as if we're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. But if you take a step back and you look at what other, other cities are facing, a lot of these are America problems. So like the cost of housing is going up and it's like, yeah, and that's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Gun violence is a problem. That's unfortunately everywhere in America. You know, our, we have challenges with our transportation system, homelessness, our school system. These are like every big city has these problems. So I, I guess the question is, do we look for internal solutions? Are we, are we trying to figure these out on our own? Do we look at our peer cities and see what they're doing? How do we, you know, how do we face some of these things that um, we're really quick to blame upon ourselves, but really it's, it's larger systemic issues that are the root cause. Yeah. And you know, you can have like positive stress and negative stress. You can mm -hmm. have positive information and negative information. At the end of the day, it's like how you look at it and how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of working in city hall for, for far too many years, um, it feels like 50, um, <laughs> is that you have way a lot of facts on who's doing what and why it is or is not working and how much money it would take to make it better. And you may have seen that, you know, the, the council uh, team this week worked with the mayor to announce 9 million in new funding for the community shelter board. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's really good. That is really going to help them stabilize all the agencies they work with to deliver homeless services for this year. Mm. Right. But we're not solving the root cause of homelessness, which is in part the eviction crisis, mm -hmm. in part the lingering effects of the COVID crisis, in part the fact that not everyone is sharing in our prosperity. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier how we're a young city and a lot of people do move on over time, but that means we have a lot more of a rental market maybe mm -hmm. than some peer cities. Mm -hmm. And when you start jacking those rents up, it is going to be a pain point that a lot of people feel. So, so you get all this information in your head about it, and you're also constantly looking like, how can we do this a little better? Mm -hmm. um, but also, we travel also, and we do know homelessness is a problem everywhere. Every major city, especially in the warmer states, mm -hmm. are really struggling with this right now. Um, so as an America problem, we also think we need to be stacking hands and dealing with it on a national, state, and local level. If everyone just expects the city of Columbus to solve homelessness, well, you know, I'll take that Nobel Prize prize but i'm not confident that that is actually the answer we've really got to put our hearts together as a community and say this is unacceptable there's always going to be some people who choose to live on the land mm -hmm. we, we do need to accept that, that some homelessness is partially natural um, whether it's for mental health or lifestyle choices um, but a mother with three kids who just got evicted did not choose to live in that car right right that is tragic yeah. and the longer you let that continue the more likely it will be repeated mm -hmm. so we've got to figure out where we can have the biggest impact on humans and sometimes that's one family at a time mm -hmm. to get it to to start breaking some of these cycles um i do not see an end zone yet but i know that with our push to increase funding to the community shelter board we're also in conversations with the franklin county commissioners we're in uh, conversations with suburban cities mm -hmm. We think there's a shared responsibility here. Of course. And for the, the city of Columbus has been the funder of homeless services for a couple decades now, the key funder. Mm -hmm. um, now there's federal pass-through dollars. You know, there's a lot of different ways that money comes into the system through the city and county. Um, but we do believe that there's others who are affected by it, or maybe they have pushed it out into mm -hmm. Columbus. Mm -hmm. um, and we think they all should be playing a role. Um, this is humanitarian, but it's also, at the end of the day, it's the best for your economy. Um, and it, some of it goes back to our housing crisis, which I could talk about for about an hour. Um, we have a supply problem. And you know how you, you say sometimes people will bring a critique of the city's doing this wrong and how can you keep doing this? Mm -hmm. One of the biggest ones we'll ever hear is incentives for development. Um, and maybe 2% of the land in Columbus is incented right now, mm -hmm. which to me is not a horrible number. If you're getting 98% productive, everything's working out, that's actually really good for a city. Yeah. But the fact is we have such a supply problem. Why are they not pulling those building permits? Because if they can't make the math work, they will not build. Yeah. And if we don't get building right now at all price points, we can't solve the problem. Because right. those who have means will simply buy all the cheaper product and make it more expensive product. Yeah. At the end, the, the lower income families are going to get squeezed no matter what. So anything the city can do to inspire more construction, um, I believe is the philosophy of council right now. Let's go for it. Let's fight for it. Yeah. Um, and that means sometimes going up against neighborhood commissions that are just like, you know, this project's a monstrosity. It's a whale. I can't believe you're thinking about doing that in our historic and or residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then it, a lot of times it's like, uh, we don't want those people living near us. Right. That is a very quick way 
to make city council not really as interested in your case. Yeah. Um, we need every kind of housing for every kind of people. Mm. It needs to be balanced. It needs to be spread. And we must do more density, period, in this community. Yeah. We have pancaked out to 224 square miles in the city of Columbus. Mm -hmm. We have got to go up along these transit corridors that CODA, Morpsey, and the city are all working on to, to fundamentally change the way we move people. But by also, if, if you are in a very, very, very residential neighborhood, you should super support this. Why? Because the density is going to the corridors. Right. That actually helps protect the intact neighborhoods mm -hmm. in a lot of areas that maybe aren't appropriate for 10-story buildings. Sure, sure. But to argue but, that but, you but, couldn't have a 10-story building on High Street yeah. doesn't really resonate with yeah, us. <laughs> yeah, but, but you, you make a really good point about there's a lot of fear. The D word, density, strikes a lot of fear in people. And yet... Uh, we, we as right before we started recording, we we're talking about ADUs a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, adding an ADU to a property basically doubles the density from like a single family house to two. You know, so you've you've just increased the density of that unit twofold. We're big fans. without building a skyscraper, right? Big fans. Yeah. So so allowing for duplexes, fourplexes, gentle density. A mm -hmm. lot of urban planners are kind of referring to it yep. as, as that. Uh, and just getting people to understand that, like, it doesn't mean that a skyscraper is going to block out the sun next to your house. It could just mean that. That's a real argument, though. It, it because I've been is. growing tomatoes yeah. in my urban neighborhood for yeah. so many years, and this skyscraper will block out the sun, and I won't be able to grow <laughs> tomatoes anymore. Right, exactly. True stories. Yeah. Um, but no, you're right. And yeah. that's why we're not only changing the rules on ADU, because, I mean, our zoning is very antiquated right now. Mm -hmm. It's literally a, a last vestige of the redlining racist yeah. days. Um, that's bad. Mm -hmm. We must change our zoning to make it simpler to understand, to make it more user-friendly for everybody, and at the end of the day, drive down the cost of developing new housing, whether it's ADUs along alleys over garages, mm -hmm. whether it's higher density things along the, the big transportation routes that Linkus will provide. Um, if we don't do these things, we can never reach our goals, yeah. and prices will continue to inflate. And I'm not foolish, and I don't think our council members are foolish enough to think that we're ever going to be like, yes, this is going to radically drop rents, mm -hmm. right? I've never seen a market where they radically drop rents. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. But we can slow down the growth. Right. 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 And it's what Council President Harden talks about a lot is like we are becoming a big city. Mm -hmm. But we still want to protect that hometown friendliness, the feel that we have, mm -hmm. um, the the congeniality that we can have without just becoming polarized like some cities get and the politics become polarized. We've avoided that here so far. But big cities as they grow into their stature, are going to face big problems. Mm -hmm. But the caveat is, bring me big solutions. Right. We've got a team right now that is very open-minded. You've got a very progressive city council team. We've got three new members who are hitting it right now, hitting the ground running. Mm -hmm. um, and they are passionate about these topics. They're willing to work with the community. Um, the key is always, you know, how you approach it, how you bring in your big ideas, um, and what are you fighting for. But right now, if you're fighting for affordability and housing and housing production and quality housing, you're probably going to have a pretty open-eared audience. Yeah. I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, a second ago as well about kind of bringing our suburban partners along for the ride and solving, you know, things like homelessness and, you know, uh, gaps in the education systems and uh, the housing issues because um, the city of Columbus can only do what it can do within its municipal boundaries. You know, um, a lot of our suburbs want to be workforce centers, have more jobs, but if an entry level job exists in a suburb, and they're unwilling to build entry-level housing for that, mm -hmm. then you're making a transportation problem for the region, right? You expect people to live in cheap housing in one neighborhood and drive across the city for a job. Or spend uh, two hours on a bus. Yeah, yeah. For which a is just, minimum wage job. Right, right. So how, how, do, we, how do we encourage <clears throat> them, incentivize them, get the right mindset behind carrying water for some of the problems? They, they can't just be like little islands where problems get pushed out. Well, I think you've probably, you know, those who are really watching local governments are probably seeing more bully pulpit use lately, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> especially uh, the mayor. We have a, there's a group of central Ohio mayors and like officials who meet, you know, Mayor Ginther and others have started to force these conversations a little more. Cool. But the bully pulpit can only go so far. Mm -hmm. um, what are the finances mm -hmm. and what is the market? Um, and, you know, I'm one who might criticize any one of our suburban partners for some long-term decision they've made and held the line on, it shall always be like this. Mm -hmm. um, when I hear communities like literally having politicians doing advertisements saying, we must stop Columbus encroaching on us and Columbus-style yes. <laughs> development. I saw that. I'm like... 
that's that's really divisive for one. Yeah. It's not rational for two, and it actually won't work for your community for the long term. Right. It's it won't work. Yeah. But then I see like I'll, I'll give kudos. I'll name the people I can give kudos to. Dublin for many years was not really a participant in density conversation. They were maybe one of the hardest places to develop. But with what they've done at Bridge Park, it's truly a new day. And it's super successful, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because they're balancing out different kinds of housing densities. And they've created a whole new retail center that is very competitive in this mm -hmm. market. Yeah. And now, um, and now everyone's trying to emulate them. Yeah. Yeah. So I am. it does give me hope that people are listening. But within that, you can't just be like, and every apartment will start at $1,700. Right, exactly. But yeah. we do have other partners. I mean, I got to say, Whitehall has mm -hmm. really, really started turning. I mean, Whitehall had a lot of challenges, and every city's got a lot of challenges. But they have really been working very hard to build and attract more quality housing, and it's often at a much more affordable thing, tied to some of the development we're seeing going east. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm excited to see places like Dublin, Whitehall, Hilliard are all on these new transit routes mm -hmm. that Link Us will support. Mm -hmm. um, because we do have to make sure people can get to the jobs, mm -hmm. wherever that job is. You also got to get to childcare. Um, we're also talking to the schools. The schools, I believe, are not entirely convinced they need to be in the busing game. But if they're not, and you don't have true neighborhood schools, mm -hmm. then your city busing system had better be high class. Um, and so one of the things here is Linkus doesn't just build these new routes, right, for BRT and more express service for the long hauls, but also almost a doubling of the service area, the way we serve current routes. Right. Um, and those things have to all work together for density to actually work. Mm -hmm. um, because then it gets to something else we talked about briefly earlier. Parking, you know, if a parking space, a single parking space is going to cost you thirty grand. Here in the urban core um but you can maybe in the future build a quarter as many of them because people can get around through other methods and modes um you just radically reduced the the financial demands for that project sure yeah. and at the end of the day do that enough times you reduce rents in those areas right right i think a lot of people don't even realize that we don't have a downtown uh a parking minimum for downtown i think columbus is kind of ahead of the game yep. on on eliminating that uh, fortunately, we have so many acres and acres of surface lots right, still. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but over time, I mean, just in the time that we've we've lived here, mm -hmm. the the change downtown, starting with Gay Street mm -hmm. and density moving throughout with new housing, is is just really beautiful. Yeah, I yeah. think Gay Street should be a model for many streets in this city. As we do slow down traffic, as we get those beautiful trees planted, mm -hmm. and it shows that when you do develop in those areas, people flock to it. Yeah. Long Street now, you know, I, I go to Roosevelt Coffee a lot. Long Street is night and day different than it used to. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And right over towards your house, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, 20 years ago, the arena district was like just getting started. It was still mostly parking lots around the arena. Dirt. Yeah. Dirt yeah. lots, gravel. Yeah. And now it's almost all built out. Yeah. And what did it take? It took the city and the private sector working together. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the city's really good at building sewer lines. We're pretty good at building roads, mm -hmm. sidewalks. We'll, we'll get you some nice light, light posts, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but we shouldn't be having to build all the housing and to, to, to incentivize all the things that we do. Right. If the market gets a little bit better, it takes off on its own then. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's really, it's really powerful to see. You know, we put in that parking garage, that will pay for itself, usually in 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's just pure benefit to the city. Um, but we also get, you know, here's 400 cars that aren't needing street spaces. Right. Um, but those partnerships are key. Yeah. And I think the arena is one of the best examples of where it actually worked. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know we joked before we started that uh, we don't have any peer cities. Columbus doesn't have <laughs> peer cities. But um, I, I do think I, it's been interesting to talk with some of the folks behind the zone in uh, conversations about updating zoning because other cities are going through, you know, eliminating single family housing and lo looking at what other cities have done uh, around some of those kinds of mm -hmm. conversations. One of the concerns that I've heard is that we're trying to not have the exact same issues that places like Austin and Nashville are having. A lot of times when you talk density, people look at like New York or, uh, San Francisco, yeah. you know, but really like some of our, you know, mid-sized cities in America that have had explosive job growth or explosive, you know, uh, I mean, Nashville is like, it's, what is it? The Vegas of the East, yes. you know, it's where every bachelorette party happens. It's mm -hmm. a country music hub. It's an entertainment destination. The cost of living has just shot through the roof, through the roof. and we don't want to go down that road. So are there other cities that you've looked at or studied to see either things going well, things we should avoid? Like what, what should we, we be kind of looking, we do looking look, out I mean, toward? Depending which study it is, you know, there's 15 to 23 that we really do watch a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you've just named two of them though, because Austin and Nashville is, is cool and funky and there's still a lot of authentic, really good stuff in these cities, right? Mm -hmm. But they did not 
have a handle on the housing booms Mm -hmm. that they had, the job booms, and they did not plan their transportation along with them. Right. We are still early enough. And uh, if you if you listen to any of President Harden's link us speeches, because he's talking on this topic all the time, we're still early enough where we can still get a grasp on some of this growth and guide it along dense transit routes. Mm-hmm. That is what will define the next 20 years. Mm-hmm. And if we do it wrong, it will really get a lot worse here. And you'll have that horrible congestion and pockets of um, just absolutely unaffordability mm-hmm. um, throughout the city. And eventually that then leads to a other decline because people especially creative and artistic people maybe early in their career just will not be able to find their place right you know right. franklinton's awesome right now but franklinton's already developing fairly fast mm-hmm. and almost every property has been bought up you know so what's going to happen now south on high as you head towards the fort mm-hmm. and some of the new developments going down there what's south parsons future look like livingston avenue if that becomes a, a route for link us mm-hmm. which i think it should or not livingston maine but that Livingston Main Corridor mm-hmm. could be amazing. Right. And we could really go a lot denser while still protecting a lot of the authentic neighborhood there. Um, and if you can find that balance, then that's the big thinking that actually helps you get it done. Um, but though you've named a couple of them. Atlanta is one that just many years ago just sprawled. They, they pancaked like worse than us. And we have to learn from that. San Francisco right now rates. You can't afford to live there. You know, everybody got drove out to Oakland over a decade ago. Mm-hmm. And now even that's becoming unaffordable. The, it will not work here if we just keep doing what they've done in the past. Right. We need to fundamentally change transportation and density. And that is link us on the ballot in November. We're hoping that people come out and support that. And also get involved with the zone in conversation. Phase one of zone in is really just about the corridors. Right. The high traffic, high density potential corridors. Mm -hmm. If we do that well, and I think we will, it will make so many things easier to get done for the long term and to keep it somewhat affordable because at the end of the day we don't have every penny just to put into transportation and development mm-hmm. we've got to do all the other jobs that a city has um, but I think the first hearing is actually this evening and there's going to be three or four more hearings they're actually going to create like a show and tell space uh, over here uh, on the city council or the city of Columbus's campus um, where people can come in and go through all the presentation materials and stuff and ask questions we want people to be articulate um, they can be critical, um, but don't just say, just leave it alone. Because mm-hmm. everybody knows the variance process is not yeah. good. The The fact that you can't build a duplex, basically, in urban neighborhoods right now is silly. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a way that actually our forefathers built great cities. Mm-hmm. You know, There's a ton of duplexes in Harrison West. Mm-hmm. But under the modern code, it's almost impossible to get done. And why should you have to get lawyers and architects and do all this other stuff just to get a zoning variance? All that is is basically saying, you can build this. Despite what the code says. Right. So right. why don't we clean the code up mm-hmm. so it's more fundamental and balanced and fair for everybody? Yeah. It adds a lot of uh, time lag to projects mm-hmm. and a lot of additional costs. And so if we're trying to speed things up, yep. it makes a lot of sense. And But you also have to do it while still respecting area commissions have a role. They are the sure. voice of their neighborhood. Yeah. And I do think that's where some of the long-term pain will be mm-hmm. is, is once these things move, if we can get them all done, you know, what does the new balance look like mm-hmm. a year from now? And then we'll go into the neighborhood version of the zone in initiative, um, which will affect some neighborhoods more than others. But um, that will probably be even more fraught yeah. um, because nobody wants to lose the character of their neighborhood, even though they know some of the stuff is archaic. Right, right. Um, well, I think we plowed through a lot of topics in a pretty quick amount of time. Um, as always with the Confluence cast, we like to ask, uh, the same closing question to each of our guests. What is Columbus doing well and what is Columbus doing not so well? I think we're in a golden age of planning. I agree. And, uh, there's a plan for a little bit of everything. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to remember that we're also a city of doers Mm -hmm. and we've got to finish some of the games. Mm -hmm. So even with the first downtown plan is revolutionary as it really was in 2002, Mm -hmm. uh, grandpa Brown here thinking, um, we only got a couple of the big things done. Mm -hmm. And the biggest one was one making people think different about downtown Mm -hmm. and two, a push for housing. Mm -hmm. Now, as you said, we went from 3000 to 11,000 residents downtown net benefit. Overall, I think everybody argues that downtown's more fun, interesting, but it still could be a lot better. Um, so the plans have to get done. And if out of the second one, the 2010 plan, you know what my favorite thing is. I am beyond 
personally just proud of the work we were able to do to fundamentally change our riverfront downtown. Mm -hmm. 33 acres of new green space and parks, public art installations. It's just beautiful. When you're down there for a festival now and you see people on the river in kayaks yeah. and you see people walking their dogs every day and kids playing, it just it lights up my heart. I'm yeah. so proud of the work we did there. And again, total public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, private sector came in with tens of millions of dollars to help get it done. And in the meantime, we rebuild a couple bridges. Um, but but what we don't do well is the same part of the same story. When we announced some of those plans, there were people literally going around screaming, why are you spending, you know, whatever it was, $100 million on a bridge to nowhere? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for it? Why would I want that? No one will ever go to Franklinton. Mm -hmm. We currently have like a billion dollars in new development in Franklinton. Okay. You do have to have faith and put the naysayers in a proper context, mm -hmm. but you also have to have doers who are willing to put up with that and the harassment that comes with it to just be like, no, we believe this is the right thing to do for our city, but it's also a good business decision. At the end of the day, this will make us more sustainable long term. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff we have been able to do with an eye towards green. That river was polluted. It was dirty. It was nasty. It did not function as a natural ecosystem. I've seen a beaver downtown now. Okay, we have fundamentally changed the life and health of that river. Is it perfect yet? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But from Ohio State's campus all the way down to the Green Lawn Dam, yeah. it is a much better experience. It is nicer. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Mike, for spending the time today. Uh, always fun to talk to you. You have a way to get me going, Walker. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Tim, for all the help. And uh, just let us know if we can be helpful. Thank you for listening to the Confluence Cast presented by Columbus Underground. Again, you can get more information on what we discussed today in the show notes for this episode at theconfluencecast.com. Please rate, subscribe, share this episode of the Confluence Cast with your friends, family, contacts, enemies, your favorite public servant. If you're interested in sponsoring the Confluence Cast, get in touch with us. We can be reached by email at info at theconfluencecast.com. Our theme music was composed by Benji Robinson. Our producer is Philip Cogley. I'm your host, Tim Fulton. Have a great week.